I'm Alicia. Welcome to Burn of Proof. Welcome. It's a Savannah day. Yay. Well, it's actually a both of us day, but this is a Savannah episode. Savannah episode. We are doing one of my personal favorite cases because it's got some some good 911 calls. And so just FYI, trigger warning, if you're not into 911 <laughs> calls, this is not the episode for you. I mean, they're no. on the killer side. You're not going to be hearing like panicked victims voices, which I know that's upsetting. Um, yeah. This is the killer calling in, but it's really cool. We're doing Paul Michael Stefani today, also known as the weepy voiced killer. I still question any relation <laughs> to Gwen Stefani. To Gwen, Stefani. <laughs> Gwen, is this your uncle? Oh, no. <laughs> Please get at us. I don't think so because it. I doubt well, it. <coughs> I doubt it. <gasps> he has a daughter. He's estranged too. Oh, it's Gwen. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Definitely not. But all the same, I really love this case. Nicholas, my boyfriend, really likes this case. I think you're gonna like this case. Although it will leave you with a lot of questions. A lot of this is gonna be like us. Um, guessing as to what he's yes. possibly doing i have theories we'll get into my theories okay okay i um, like theories yeah i'm curious to see how you feel at the end about everything because people go both ways on this one so we'll see okay all right i'm ready i'm gonna set the scene for you you ready ready painting a picture getting my bob ross brush out <laughs> With my words. Get ready to paint some happy little trees. <laughs> some happy little X. New Year's Eve, 1990. Or 1980, excuse me. Excuse me, 1980. Uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. Okay. This whole case takes place in the Twin Cities, which I didn't know this, but it's uh, the Twin Cities are St. Paul and Minneapolis, Minnesota. So Yes. I didn't know that. I don't know anything about geography. Fun geography facts. Geography facts. Yo. Uh, anyway, that's all. I like geography, but I'm not. No, I would not. I would not win a geography B. No, you know, in uh, Paul Blart Mall Cup, where he goes, "Fun fact for you," it's like a, a long <laughs> yeah. running family joke. So, <laughs> if I ever do that, you know, when I'm talking about Paul Blart Mall Cup. Fun fact for you: I need to fix these things. All right, twenty-year-old uh, Karen Potak was out partying her way into the new year with her friends. Uh, she pulled pulled the old Irish exit and. Uh, was very drunk and disappeared off into the night. She left her friends. Um, I don't know if they knew she was leaving. I doubt it because normally you yeah. don't let your friends leave when they're drunk. But she was very drunk. She didn't even bring her coat. So it's New Year's. It's January in <laughs> Minnesota. So you're freezing. But she had her little drunk blanket on. So she didn't her feel drunk it. blanket. Okay. Yeah, that's what you're, when you're drunk, you don't feel cold. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So you, I literally see there's my literal brain working again. I literally <laughs> envision like, oh, she's like, I'm getting drunk. So I'm, here's my blanket. No, she was in a she was in a club, so <laughs> or a bar. <laughs> no blanket. No blanket. Um, so she's out and she's walking around town and she is drunk. And up beside her pulls 36 year old Paul Stefani. He's up in this warm car and he offers her a ride home with safety and warm. How very kind of him. Three hours later, the police received this phone call. Yes, please. This is an emergency. Please send a squad to Pierce Butler Road, Malmberg Manufacturing Company, Machine Shop. Please, there's an ambulance, too. There's a girl hurt there. Can you tell me what happened to her? Just hurry. There's a, she's laying on the ground in the back by the, by the railroad tracks, by the edge here. What, what's the address? I don't know. Who are you? So, I don't know. What you hear in that is Paul Stefani calling the police to report that at the Malvern Manufacturing Company machine shop, there was a girl who was badly hurt there. She was out by the train tracks. Um, please send help. Please send it now. And the police officer or the dispatcher says, who are you? He hangs up the phone. So. <laughs> he said that like, like Stefani would say that. <laughs> Yeah. Who are you? Who are you? Like he oh. started talking back to <laughs> everybody talk this way. No. no. I, it could happen. It I could, could see. It could catch on. It could happen. <laughs> um, 
if I don't laugh my way through this case, I'll cry because his voice starts to creep me out. So I apologize if there's extra, extra giggles. Three hours later, officers find Potak's naked body in a snowbank near railroad tracks outside of the shop. She had been beaten to the point in which her skull was cracked um, and her brain was poking out. Um, But despite this, she survived. She was rushed to the hospital and she lived. Unfortunately, she was injured so badly that she does have some severe brain trauma and she was not able to remember the incident or remember her attacker's identity. So we're going to back up and we're going to talk a little bit about Paul growing up. I just wanted to kind of set the scene with the severity of his crimes because we are going to joke a lot. He sounds really goofy. He's kind of pathetic, but it's, you know, these women were seriously attacked and beaten. and It was horrible. So, yeah, I want to just set the scene right away. So September 8th, 1944, Stefani was born in Austin, Minnesota. There's this is so frustrating because there's really not a lot. He was raised one of 10 children in a household that was described as intensely religious. So, oh, there's that religious fundamentalism. Yeah. Again. So he was like a fundy Christian <laughs> growing up, um, either fundy Christian or heavily Catholic. It's kind of hard to tell. Gotcha. He says that his stepfather or his father was not like particularly abusive based off of his report, um, but that like. You know, if they got in his way, he would, like, kick him down the stairs. Oh, you know, just cash. Normal. Yeah. Not really abusive, though. Normal treatment. I kick my kids all the the time. What are you talking about? I don't. I'm joking. (laughs) Please do not call children's services on me. She's a very great mother, I can attest. I personally struggle to believe that there wasn't abuse in the household, at least psychologically and physically by his father, psychologically probably by his mother just tends to kind of happen in these religious homes, unfortunately. It kind of sucks. Regardless, he was apparently fine pretty much behavioral-wise. There was no reports of anything. Um, He got married to a woman named Beverly, and they ended up having a daughter. But eventually they divorced. It's not really known why they divorced. It's also not really known why he had no contact with his daughter. So I can't say that she's Gwen Stefani. We've never seen the two of them (laughs) in the same room. We've never seen them. But... You can't even find his daughter's name. Like, it's it's because it's Gwen Stefan. <laughs> because it's Gwen. No, I don't want. Please don't send me a cease and desist. I promise. We know it's Gwen <laughs> it's, We know it's, we know it's probably not her. Probably. She has an older brother that was in oh, no yeah. doubt with her. So we're sure it's not no, no, her. No, he had no other children. Yeah. It was just the so. daughter. Um, so after they divorced, he wasn't super, like, affected by their divorce. Divorce, excuse me. But he did start dating a Syrian woman post-divorce, and they were very in love and very happy. Unfortunately, she got deported by her family to get pushed into an arranged marriage. And this was extremely upsetting for Paul. He was devastated by this news. But up until this point, nothing. And then we have Karen Potak. I want to comment, but all that <laughs> all that I can think of is his voice. Yeah. It's so a- like I just keep wanting to make comments in that mm-hmm. voice. Like maybe that's why all these women leave you. Because you're so weepy. Um, he's actually not like that all the time. No, I'm sure he's not. Yeah. So only after he commits atrocious crimes. Apparently. So like I said, Karen Potak was in um New Year's of nineteen eighty. So it's really nineteen eighty one. Mm-hmm. The first day of 1981. So we have six months later. Six months later, I need to slow down. Um, 18-year-old Kimberly Compton gets off the bus in her new home of St. Paul. She put her stuff in the locker at the bus station, and she walks across the street to Mickey's Diner. She orders their special, and she sits down and begins to make polite conversation with Paul Stefani. They have a good lunch. She talks to the diner workers, and Stefani somehow convinces her that he can show her the sights of the city. So they leave together. He pulls off onto an unfinished highway and then proceeds to... It's difficult because I'm trying to think about what order I want to say things in. He proceeds to take her down to the lake area Mm -hmm. and tells her, well, you'll have something to tell your parents about if I show you the sights here. Um, At some point, he unhooks her bra and gropes her chest. Before he begins with stabbing her 62 times with an ice pick. He also strangles her with a shoelace. Um, but he was she was strangled before she died. 
So she died of the stab wounds, but was also strangled with a shoelace. Gotcha. How's she supposed to tell her parents, Paul? <laughs> Paul then makes this phone call a few hours later. Oh, yeah. You find me, I just stabbed somebody with an ice pick. I can't stop myself. I keep killing somebody. That one's pretty short and sweet. It's um, just unreal. The censored part, he says, will you goddamn find me? I just, the, the audio that I pulled from censored it because it was on the news. Yeah. There's also a portion later where we couldn't quite get the music out. So you'll understand that that's because it's. Yeah. From a news clip from the 80s. <laughs> So that was about two days after the call. And then a few hours later. Oh, excuse me. I'm jumping. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I just want to hear okay. more of the call. <laughs> excuse me. Slow down. Slow down. Slow down. <laughs> so after that call, they end up finding her body. They did not have any identification for her. She was a Jane Doe for a hot minute. Um, when they took her back to the autopsy, to the medical examiner, to be autopsied. One of them luckily turned out all her pockets and found a ticket for the locker and a bus ticket. So they went back. They pulled all her stuff. They found her ID. And then as they were autopsying her and her stomach contents, they were able to figure out what she had eaten. And it was the special for Mickey's Diner, which happened to be across the street. So they hightailed it on over there and uh, they were able to get a description of Paul from the workers there. They did not, they specifically did not give any information about the murder weapon. And I believe they even may have leaked some false information about the case. Um, Because about three hours later, after the news broke of Kimberly's death, they got another phone call with more information. So this is phone call number three. Don't talk, just listen. I'm sorry what I did to Compton. I couldn't help it. I don't know why I had to stab her. I am so upset about it. I keep getting drunk every day and I can't believe it. It's like a big dream. I I can't think of being locked up. If I get locked up, I'd kill myself. I'd rather kill myself than get locked up. I'll try not to kill anybody else. Try. (laughs) So... Couple I'll give it the good college it. try. <laughs> First of all, they did at this point know that whoever killed Kimberly was the person right. making the phone calls because they mentioned the ice pick and they had no way of knowing that. An ice yeah. pick is a weird weapon. Um, second, I love the fact that he ugh, gives me creeps that he says it's all a big dream. Mm-hmm. God, it's all a big nightmare or it's mm-hmm. all a big terrifying mess. It's all a big it's dream. A dream. All a big dream. And he's also saying he's going to try not to kill anybody else. I just he can't dream of getting locked up. If he gets locked up, he'll kill himself. Um, but that the only evidence they have is the phone calls right now. They can trace them because he's calling from pay phones. And he's gone by the time they get there. And there's no physical evidence left at the crime scene. So they're getting quite frustrated. They now have Kimberly's body and they can't find her killer. Yeah. And they can link it to Karen's attack with the phone call. Because obviously, that's the same voice. They did have a voice expert come in. And they were like, we can't definitively say. Like, so what are you, you know? How many killers call 911? (laughs) Exactly. And sound like that. Like, just a short period of time. Exactly. In the same area. Mm Mm-hmm. Come on now. Get it together. Okay. So they then released part of the call to the public thinking, okay, this is a very distinct voice. Yeah. There has to be somebody who can identify, you know, do you, who, who do you know that sounds like that, who's capable of killing people, right? Yeah. Do you know anybody that sounds like that that's capable of killing people? Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Well, apparently hundreds of people do. Oh, that's... <laughs> um, but they sorted through all the phone calls and there was really no, no match, so... That was really disappointing. I really wouldn't expect hundreds of people. Apparently. Lots of people. So they were kind of stumped. They didn't have any physical evidence, so they sat on it for about two months. Two months later, a man named Alan Lopez hit the news after he held his entire family hostage before annihilating them. 
So he did. He killed his whole family. He held them hostage. The police got there. We're negotiating this hostage situation. And at some point during this process, he confessed to killing Kimberly Compton. So they were like, okay, we'll come back to that. We're going to finish negotiating this hostage yeah. situation. And then once you're in custody, they figured they would question him then. But unfortunately, before they could, could get to question him, he killed himself. So they have this deathbed confession, basically. Um, yeah. Alan Lopez saying he killed Compton. So they had the detective from the Weepy Boys killer trial, or case, not trial, um, come in. He released his files, came out of retirement for one day, released his files so that they could try and see if Alan Lopez could possibly be the guy. So they look at the time that Kimberly was killed, and actually he was in a mental institution at the time. So they're like, okay, but let's look a little further. He had a day pass out of the hospital on the day oh. that Kimberly was gone and they did not know where he was during that time. So that's confusing. Yeah. I know. Puts a real plot twist. Plot twist. Uh, but just kidding. They knew that Karen's attack was linked to Kimberly's and he right. was in jail when Karen was attacked. So he was accounted for and it, so it couldn't be him because he couldn't have done both. Yep. So that was a real little twisty rue there. Sorry, you're not going down as an infamous serial killer. No, just a family just annihilator. Just a family <laughs> annihilator. Yeah. So, you know, that happens. But then in August 6, 1982, so we have a little over a year of a gap. Okay. Um, Barbara Simons. I've also heard it pronounced Simmons. But I'm How's it spelled? Um, I One got M both. or two? I got both. <gasps> so I'm going to say Simons. So, yep. Um, Barbara Simons was a 40 year old woman who was at the hexagon bar when she was approached by Paul. She went up to the box. The, I'm sorry. To the bartender. To the bartender. To she, the boxer. To the boxer. <laughs> she what went kind of the, bar was this? <laughs> the hexagon bar. <laughs> she went up to the bartender and said, I hope this guy's okay. I just need a ride home. Oh, yeah. sad. Yeah. So she gets a good look at him because she's like, mm, I don't like the way she said that. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah. Bye bye. They drive away. And then it's kind of up for debate whether he called right after the killing or whether he called about two days after. But this is the call we get after Barbara Simmons passes away. Fire emergency. Please don't talk to him, listen. I'm sorry, I killed that girl. I stabbed her 40 times. Kimberly Compton was the first one. Oh, my face. Oh, I don't know what you're mad at me. I'm sick. I'm going to kill myself, I think. Where are you? I'm just going to... There's so many guys with a red shirt on. It's me. I killed all of them. I'm sorry. I'm never going to make it to heaven. Calm down. Calm down. So, a lot to unpack on that one. Yeah, he, initially, you like his voice is just like unreal, but with that one, you get past the like wanting to laugh at like this isn't real, right? Like somebody's just playing around. Yeah, and that one was a little. You f you feel more hysterical at the end, which is yeah. why I'm partial to thinking that he called pretty much right after she died. Yeah, um, because the other two. Yes, he's upset, but he's more pulled, pulled together. And they weren't yeah. right after he called, like right after he did it. He called yeah. afterwards. So this one is kind of up in the air for me. I also, it's just difficult to tell if he's faking it or not. Yeah, that's a, that voice. It's yeah, especially not quite as much with that. That one sounded more like there would be genuine tears happening. Yeah. The first two felt like you're you're not. Yeah. Almost like, you know, you're trying to make yourself upset. Mm -hmm. You're trying to sound weepy. Exactly. Yeah. But it, it's weird. Um, weird. So a little while later, whether it be two days or a few hours, I'm not sure. The timeline on Barbara is a little bit messy for me. I kept finding conflicting things. So everybody mm -hmm. has a timeline, but yeah. it's just like a little off. There's nothing out there about this guy. Like, there's information about the woman he killed, and there's information about his bare minimum crimes, but to get anything more than, like, surface information was a struggle. Yeah. 
Um, so she was stabbed with either an ice pick or a screwdriver closer to like over 100 times. He says 40, but it was more than that for sure. Um, she was then thrown into the Mississippi River and she ended up getting stuck in some rocks and then washing ashore. So she would have been swept away, but she was not. I also think it's weird that in that clip he says that Kimberly Compton was the first. I'm assuming because Karen Potak didn't die, that she survived. He doesn't consider her a victim. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. But she absolutely was. Yeah. So. Still counts, Paul. Still counts. Basically, the bar staff came forward and provided a story and a description. And the bartender, who had a good look at him, was shown hundreds of mugshots. And she kept looking through and looking through. Finally, she stops them. She's like, that's him. So she points to a picture of 38-year-old Paul Stefani. It's a mugshot because he had a undisclosed aggravated assault charge that there's literally no information about, like, what happened with that. They also, when they looked into Paul a little further, now that she had pulled out his mugshot, discovered that he had been fired from the manufacturing plant that Where? Gotcha. Karen was left at. Yeah. So, come on, dude. He's leaving him a little gift. <laughs> Here's a present. Thanks for firing me. So they didn't quite have a warrant out for his arrest, but they began tailing him and doing surveillance. They were going to pull a Gacy. Yeah. Just following him around. Um, and this was working for a little while, and then they lost him in the city. So it's like just, just up and lost forever. him. Forever. Goodbye. They lost him. They weren't following him anymore. He was gone. He's just gone. Just poof. I don't know what happened with that. Some people think he caught on. I do not think that he caught on. I think he was completely oblivious because of what he does next. Boy. Next, he goes into an area of town where he knows that he can find sex workers. And he picks up 19-year-old Denise Williams. Also, there's some, like, discrepancy about how old she was. She was either, she was between 19 and 21. Gotcha. Hard to tell. They negotiated about $100 for a sex act, and she hopped into the car. I believe, it's believed she went back to their, to his apartment. They completed the sex act, and they negotiated that he would drive her back to where they began. He began driving, and as they were on their way back, Paul started to tell Denise about his sexual fantasies and then started turning down the wrong roads. Denise, unfortunately, had been a sex worker since she was about 13 or 14 years old. So she knew, hey, dude, don't hey, go the wrong bad. way. Yeah. He said, there's a shortcut. It's fine. Nothing's wrong. He continued to tell her about all his sexual fantasies. And she was like, no. Get me out of here. <laughs> Let me go. So yeah. she made eye contact with a glass bottle in his car. She was like, I see you. You're mine. I see that glass bottle. Yeah. Um, he pulled down to a road that was dark with no streetlights and it looked to be unoccupied. It looked very empty. And she says, where are you going? <laughs> Please take me back. And he basically tells her, like, cash, grass, or ass. Can't stay. And she says, well, we already did that. <laughs> yeah. And so he gets angry with her and stabs her in the stomach with a screwdriver. So they're grappling in the car. Yeah. She breaks that bottle over his head and begins to fight back. I mean, Denise did not want to go down without a fight. She was kicking and screaming and she was grabbing him and slicing him with the bottle. And he's continuously stabbing her with this screwdriver. Oh, my gosh. Philip has screwdriver that he's stabbing her with. She ends up reaching behind her, essentially, and opening the car door and falling out. And then he falls directly on top of her. And he just doesn't stop stabbing her. So he stabs her over 15 times. And she starts yelling, I'm dying, I'm dying, and then pretends to be, to be dead. All the while, Paul is screaming, you're just like the rest of those broads, over and over again. She's playing dead when all of a sudden, a man named Doug hears them. Just Doug. Doug. Hey, Doug. Doug had his window open. This was Thanks, not an empty Doug. street. There were houses further down the road that he could gotcha. not see. So Doug Canning comes running down the road, wrestles with Paul, realizes that Denise has been stabbed. Paul tries to attack Doug. Doug flees and goes to call 911. He calls 911, and then Paul's like, okay, so he left. He's going to call 911. I need to leave. Yeah. And he gets in the car and runs off. Doug comes back and comforts Denise and stays with her until the ambulance gets there which is really nice. She's rushed to the hospital where 
The court documents state that her wounds were to her head, upper right abdomen, and lower left chest. She punctured her lung and had a punctured liver as well. Oh, my gosh. She had emergency life-saving surgery, and she survived. Wow. Mm -hmm. She told the police that she had been hitchhiking because she had been in trouble for prostitution and other instances before. So she did not tell them that she was a prostitute. So then (laughs) there is another phone call, but don't worry. You don't have to listen to this one. Where Paul then calls 911 and calls for an ambulance for himself. (laughs) He has been beaten over the head heavily. And obviously, these are flesh wounds to your head. He's bleeding profusely. So he says, I got beat up. (laughs) That's what he says on the phone. I got beat up. I got beat up. So (laughs) they realize. Wait, is he weepy? Yes. (gasps) So he didn't even he's have the sense quite, to like. He's not quite as weepy as he normally is, but it, you can still tell it's him. Yeah. So dispatch is like, um, that's the guy we were following and then lost. <laughs> so we should go <laughs> pick him up. So they go and they grab him. All at the same time, Denise is out of surgery and she is telling them this wild tale that matches up with the injuries that yeah. Paul is describing. So they pick him up. They, so they also show her a lineup of pictures and she picks Paul out without a doubt. Yeah. They arrest him and they charge him with attempted murder because they did. He did. And then he left her for dead. So yep. all the days work, Paul. All the days work. You wanted them to catch you. You did. You begged. You begged very you profusely. Said, stop me. Well, you goddamn find me. I keep killing <laughs> somebody. I feel really disrespectful for laughing so much, but he's very terrifying to me because he just... Yeah, but I think, I mean, I don't ever want to come across as cold. Like, it, like you said, you have to like laugh at the stupidity, yeah, or the things, <laughs> the little things. Otherwise, it's crazy. I just can't imagine Denise's like fear when talking about this case because yeah. his voice. Can you imagine him screaming at her in that voice and that weepy? clown ish he sounds like a clown he sounds like a clown it's horrible. like i don't i don't even know i purposely like stayed away because you you were like no you know i want you to be su- surprised just because of the calls alone like i felt like so i don't even know what this guy looks like but i envision like 38 like, year old man a sad clown that's what i envision you somebody straight. dressed like made up like a sad clown if you go to our instagram you can find pictures of Every case we're in a post that way, you know what people look like. Um, <laughs> that's not a good one. Here's Paul Stefani. He looks like he could be a sad clown. He does look like he could be a sad clown. They pick him up, they interview him, and sorry, I lost my notes there. I feel like we need okay. elevator music when that's sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we need to find some elevator music for when we lose our plays. When they're questioning him, he goes from very normal to weepy. And then they start showing him pictures uh, from the case. And that's when he gets very angry. He's no longer, I mean, he's weepy. They can definitely recognize him, but yeah. it's not as hysterical. It's the yeah. same voice, but he changes his regular voice to match what mood he's in. Yeah. I mean, not, not it. normal people do that, but this is extreme. Yeah. Because he's a normal person. He sounds like a normal person until he doesn't want to. He's shown pictures and he gets very angry and he says, quote, you're not going to pin those on me. Dude, you called 911. <laughs> he was so remorseful before. Yeah. So it's it's really upsetting. So they charge him with attempted murder for Denise and the murder of Barbara Simmons. They were originally supposed to charge him with the St. Paul attacks as well, but they just did not have any physical evidence. They just had the calls linking, and so they decided not to prosecute. Which a lot of people are confused yeah. about why that happens. They're like, well, you know we did it. Because if you don't know, it could end up hurting you in the long yeah. run. Yeah. You don't want to charge somebody. And not have the evidence. Yes. You have to the actually of proof. <laughs> yes. That if, is. Yes. That's exactly right. So you if must... you don't have it and they can't convict beyond a reasonable doubt, 
it hurts you in later positions. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do that. By the way, once again, we're paralegals, not legal experts. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We do not claim to be. We keep forgetting to say that at the beginning. So we've just been saying it in the middle. Yeah. It still counts, right? Yeah, no, you say it. It's all good. (laughs) I think it's all that matters. Do not take this as legal advice. No. Prefacing, but in the past tense. The opposite of prefacing. I'm just telling you. (laughs) I'm just telling you. Just telling you. They had his family come in and people who knew him and start listening to the tapes to just verify because obviously they know, but it's just the easiest way to corroborate the evidence for them. It's just another thing they can add on. Yeah. And um, his sister's reaction kind of hurt my little heart. I was really, I felt really sad for them. Yeah. Um, she listens to the tape and she puts her head down on the table and she just says, muffles against the table. She says, that is without a doubt, my brother. And then she cries. Yeah. So we don't often think of that. So this might be a good time to explain why, unlike many true crime things, yeah. we have chosen to use the killer's first name Mm -hmm. rather than the last name because we really it's not not so much to humanize them but that we understand that the that they have family too Mm -hmm. and their family is hurt you know exactly in all of this mess just as the victim's families are absolutely so and i just i just can't imagine Walking around like we joke about Gwen Stefani, yeah. but in all honesty, who knows? Maybe she's been asked that question before. Probably exactly. everybody with the same last name as these killers struggles with that. Are asked that question. And can you even imagine to have to say, or even if you lie about it, you have that feeling of like, yeah, unfortunately I am. Yeah. Like so, it's devastating. For sure. I can't imagine. I can't put myself in that position. So um, yep. we feel that like using their first name is also just like it just covers all those bases and yeah yeah Paul was convicted in his first trial for 58 years in prison for the attempted murder and the murder Barbara Simmons not a ton of information on the first trial I submitted a records request to the Minnesota court records yeah and did not hear anything back so it's been a minute if I hear anything and I get anything back and I find anything interesting I'll do a little update, update yes. but yeah so far no cigar. They also well, we know. I was just gonna say we know from experience, yeah, that you know the court process just takes <laughs> trying, forever. Trying to get anything through the court it takes forever. It, it takes a long time. So, um, yeah, I wasn't able to find any documents. I could find the case. I can see the case. There just yeah. isn't anything that you can like view. Yeah, um, but I do think that they did not ever find a murder weapon. They never found an ice pick. I, they did have the screwdriver. Um, and you can find, actually, just careful when you're Googling unless you want to see crime scene photos because you can see in his car. They have yeah. pictures of what the inside of his car looked like after Denise Williams. So that's pretty creepy. So he, wait, so let me get this straight. Yes. He calls 911 to get help for himself. Yes. While being interrogated, he tells them, you're not going to pin this on me. Yes. But his car still, he didn't clean up his car. Yes. (laughs) Okay. Yes. Okay. He was pretty delirious. Yeah. Um, He had lost quite a bit of blood. Yeah. Um, And he really, he was kind of bold. He really didn't think he was going to get caught. So, (laughs) yeah. Also, if you remember correctly, he was watching the news stories because after Kimberly Compton, he called back. Right. So. So I gave him a false sense of security. Yep. So we'll get into like theories and stuff after I talk about his appeal because it gets gets interesting All right. later down the road. I mean, the whole case is interesting. I know. But yes. you're probably thinking we're only like basically less than 40 minutes in and he's already caught. What now? So, yeah. This is what now. <laughs> <laughs> this is the what now. This is the what now. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the appeal. So most criminals appeal their trial in one way or the other. Yeah. To get a lesser sentence. So when they convicted, they convicted him with double departure, saying that because of how harsh his crime was against Denise Williams, he got twice the sentence for the attempted murder. He got 20, 203 months, which came out to like, I think, 12 years. 
Oh, don't make me do math. I'm gonna look. In my head. If I'm wrong, it's gonna look. I'm gonna look really <laughs> stupid. Hold on. <laughs> I especially with the with the type of work that I do as a paralegal, I don't have to do a lot of math. Sixteen years, almost seventeen years, basically. Gotcha. Um. So. Excuse me, BRB, my B real just came up. If you guys are Gen Z, you know what your B real is. So I have to take care of this because it's time. <laughs> this is really funny if you know what a B real is. If you don't, then I just sound really rude. <laughs> <laughs> so rude. Sorry. A B real is like, it's like Instagram, but you're friends. And so you have like two minutes to do it. <laughs> um, if you so do rude. have it, you, you understand. If you don't have it, then I sound like an asshole. And I'm really sorry. Um. Anyway, it was priced the, twice the sentence for Denise because of how cruel the nature of the crime was. Um, they also gave a 21-month consecutive, consecutive imprisonment for the second-degree d- assault of Doug Panning because he attempted and yeah. assaulted Doug in the process. There's a lot of things that they added, they tacked on as they could because they yeah. knew that St. Paul was not going to be able to prosecute. Right. So then when he appealed... Doug decided that he was going to, not Doug, I'm sorry, Paul. Doug, you were a hero. <laughs> I was going to say, poor Doug. Poor Doug. Doug was poor a Doug. hero. We're sorry, Doug. Um, they had 13 different issues with the case that they cited when trying to appeal. Yeah. The one that upsets me the most is that they wanted, um, Denise Williams had a record. And they, wa- they that was not allowed in evidence in the first trial. Yeah. Yeah. Because you don't do that ever. Except in the staircase. And, <laughs> Except and in the staircase. So they did not allow it in the first trial. And the prosecution was like, no, 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 no. If you allowed that in, they would never have given double departure. They wouldn't have doubled his sentence. So her, her charges were in August 1st, 1980, Denise, another juvenile, robbed a woman. Um, they both showed knives and used threatened and threatened to rob a woman. And then pushed her into a taxi cab and assaulted her. Moved on. July 8th, 1981, Denise Williams, along with another accomplice, met with a man whom they offered and he agreed to engage in sex. They went into his car at the parking lot. Williams prepared to have sex, quote unquote. Her accomplice threatened the man with, with a knife. Um, she grabbed his, Denise grabbed his wallet and they fled. And she was charged with this. So those are the things that they did not allow on the record. And the court the defendant is telling court, well, if this was on the record, yeah. you wouldn't have convic- convicted me with double departure. They wanted to have, quote, like a downward departure, which would be that they would lessen his sentence based off of that. There was no evidence that Denise tried to rob him. The only purpose the evidence would serve, and this is, I'm reading straight from the judge's yeah. opinion. Um, the only evident, the only purpose that the evidence would serve would be to show that Williams acted in conformity with her prior behavior, and this is explicitly prohibited under Rule 404B. The evidence cannot be used when its sole relevance is to show the victim's probable actions in the time of the alleged crime. Basically, he goes on to say that this would not have affected the result of right. the trial. His crime was still just as horrible, and he denied this. Like, they denied the appeal for that portion. Yeah. Um, they also said that the fact that Denise lied about hitchhiking and her prostitution would have changed the outcome, and it did not. It had no effect on the case still whatsoever. still stabbed her. <laughs> yes, it did not. You still um, stabbed her. You drove her to a secluded road, no. and you stabbed her. Exactly. So they were doing all of this to try and say that Paul Stefani was just acting in self-defense. She clearly tried to rob him. They could not, by any means prove that Stefani had acted in self-defense because obviously they could not prove that he was meeting Denise with equal force. And that right. is the rule with self-defense. Yep. You have to meet with equal force. Deadly force and she's can only laying be on the ground deadly force. Saying, I'm dying. I'm dying. <laughs> the court literally called her a slight woman. She was yeah. tiny. Yeah. She was he was unprovoked. She was little. He was way larger than she was. And there's no way that that could have happened. Um that they were they were very kind of scuffled and easily pushed her out of the car door and drove off exactly so they they basically laughed that off there was no reversible error in the conviction and sentencing of the appellant for attempted murder in the second degree and assault in the second degree i'm going to read kind of a longer quote from judge crippen's opinion because it includes 
speak of um, Doug's testimony. So he testified mm-hmm. and he had some pretty gnarly stuff. Uh, but I couldn't find exact quotes, but I did find this paraphrasing of his quote by the judge. Gotcha. It's kind of a longer paragraph. So, okay. You want to drink some water? Can you fill the time? Um, uh, I'm kind of on the spot here. I don't know. Should I start ch- talking like the weepy killer? <laughs> Should I start talking You're like good. a sad clown? You're good. I did this. Okay. It's all good. Perfect. <laughs> Let me get my judge's <laughs> voice on. <laughs> The trial court rejected appellant's request for downward departure. From an analysis of all the information provided, this court can find no mitigating factors that the defendant was physically or mentally impaired or lacked substantial capacity for judgment when the offense was committed. I am not convinced that the defendant made a vicious... Wait, I'm sorry. I am convinced. (laughs) I am convinced that the defendant made a vicious, unprovoked attack on a slight woman. The trial court found two aggravating factors justifying the double departure particular cruelty to the victim and injury to a victim by a defendant who had a prior felony conviction for an act in which he even injured a victim. The record supports the trial court's determination to depart upward and to oppose consecutive sentence for the assault. The court noted that the appellant's vicious, that the appellant viciously attacked Williams. An independent eyewitness described in agonizing detail four to five slow and deliberate stabbings with a Phillips screwdriver forcing the weapon into flesh and bone, lacerating the liver and collapsing a lung. The witness noticed the defendant had some difficulty piercing the weapon into the flesh and meeting with resistance, had to use some force to accomplish penetration. The resistance was such that the witness actually heard what he reported as a crunch of the bones, and the victim herself herself described the pain and burning as the weapon was forced into her flesh. As noted by the state, defendant's choice of tool was not a knife designed to cut, but a Phillips screwdriver, which required deliberate efforts to puncture the victim's skin. Defendant did not merely stab Miss Williams once or twice, allegedly in self-defense, as he contended, but rather with savage statistic brutality and cruelty while astride the victim holding her down. Oh. I mean, This was not self-defense. No. And, you know, like when you talk about he stabbed her with a Phillips head screwdriver, and all of us know, well, Okay, I should say that. Not all of us know what a Phillips head is. So for those of you who aren't familiar with tools, Phillips head screwdriver is the one that looks like a little cross at yes. the end. The um, other one is called a flat head. Yes. And it is a flat head. <laughs> <laughs> looks flat. It's flat. At the end. Um, but those of us that know that tool, like, yes, you envision like, yeah, that would, like you would have to put some force, but you don't think about like, how much force you would really have to, and you yeah. would, because it's it's not crazy sharp. Like the end yeah. is a little bit sharp, but it's not so sharp that you could easily stab no, somebody. I've like hit myself, you know, trying to screw something in, and yeah. it's fallen and hit my hand, and I didn't stab through my hand. Yeah, if I had done that with a knife, it would have stabbed through my hand. Yes. So it's not like, come on, Paul. Paul's defense team was trying, man. They had 13 counts. I just went over a few of them because the rest of them were I laughable. Mean, so. I do feel for these people who defend the defense teams for these killers because... Oh, man, that's a job I could never do. You're handed a flaming pile of poo. Me. <laughs> what do you do with and that? Said, Figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> do the best you exactly. can. Exactly. So, well, we're not done yet. Oh, boy. 12 years later... Paul was diagnosed with skin cancer and he was given less than a year timeline to live. He immediately calls the St. Paul Police Department and says that I need to speak with you. He tells them, I'll give you information in exchange for a photo of my mother's headstone. So his mother has passed away. What's a picture of mommy's grave? That's an interesting exchange. <laughs> exactly. Um, so they, they comply. They bring him a picture of the headstone because they're like, I mean, okay, this isn't really going to hurt us in any way. Yeah. He confesses to everything. He confesses to Compton. He confesses to Karen Potak. Um, they give more insight into Kimberly talking about when he took her to the river because originally they did not have that information. They didn't know that he had yeah. taken her and, and taken her bra off and groped her and then killed her. Yeah, I was wondering how, how we would know that. Nope. He tells them now. and then. He says he snapped. He says, oh, well, I, I had the op- he, quote, I had the opportunity to make another friend. You like making friends. 
I don't know why so I did it. Y'all can see my face right now. <laughs> she says, <laughs> what? what in the world? What? what? Um, says, he says he snaps, but then he brought the weapon with him from the car to where they had gone to sit in the grass. So it, <laughs> you don't, that's premeditation, dude. Paul. Paul, you brought it with you. Paul. Paul. People don't, it, she's the one he stabbed with the ice pick. Yeah. Yeah. Who carries an ice pick around with them, Paul? Apparently, Paul. I don't know. I know you do live in Minnesota and it's gold, but, but come on now. Come on. Um, I've, I've met, by the way, everyone I've ever met from Minnesota is extremely sweet. Oh, absolutely. This is nicest very people. For sure. Um, so then Paul says, oh, I killed somebody you didn't know about. What? He confesses to drowning her in her own bathtub. But he doesn't know her name and he doesn't really give them much information. He tells them what county it's in. So they go and they talk to the medical examiner and they were able to able to match it to 33 year old Kathleen Green. Kathleen in July, July 21st, 1982, Kathleen was supposed to be going on a trip with her friend Carol. Uh, Carol came to pick her up that morning and she didn't come to the door. So after waiting for a while, she went inside the unlocked house, which was already really weird. And they found Kathleen in a full bathtub, face up, and she was dead. So this is different because there's no phone call and yeah. she wasn't stabbed or strangled. So it was a little weird until they found out that um, Paul actually knew her personally. So they had found her address book when they were going through all of her things and his name and number were in her address book. They originally, they did say that this was really weird before they ruled the death an accident. And they were originally looking at her estranged husband, but he ended up having an alibi and yeah. it was labeled as an accident until Paul confessed. Hmm. So that's really weird. So now we're going to talk a little bit about my theories. Yeah, theories. My theories. So the first theory is that he was not remorseful and that he was lying no. every time he called. Yeah. Right. The second thing is that he was remorseful and that he, here's my thing. He said a lot about his religion growing up and all of these issues he had with, you know, his family and growing up heavily religious. He has a quote that says, his mom always said, if something hurts you, go to God. Yeah. And so then I started, you know, the, the theory that he's calling as a confessional because what do you do when you sin in church? You confess. Yeah. That kind of has some some tact for me. Yeah. Like he's calling to give this confessional. Confessionals are supposed to be anonymous. They're usually not, but yeah. They're supposed to be anonymous. And um, I mean, I don't know. Is he remorseful and he's just confessing because that's what he thinks he's supposed to do? At one point in one of the calls, he says, I'm never gonna make it to heaven. Probably not, Paul. Probably not. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not God. I'm not but God. So if um, you're, uh, yeah, it's just, it's conflicting. Yeah. The thing that sticks out is when you snap, when they snap and they get angry. Mm -hmm. And then he says the thing to cops about not, not going to pin this on me. Copper. Copper. <laughs> he also said that after he killed, he would go to the back of the church and cry for hours. Um, And then he, he did the thing where that killers always do where they're like, when I went to kill, there's a voice in my head that oh, tells God. me, Paul, it's time to kill. <laughs> Paul, it's time. It's, time. it's the voice in his head. It's time he to claimed kill. tells him to kill, but it, that's really only mentioned once. They don't even try for an insanity defense. It doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. Um, and well, then no, because I mean, clearly he knew that he did wrong because he's calling yeah. and ratting himself out. Exactly. So there was no point in even bringing that back up. He has a quote that says, <clears throat> killing was, seemed to me, the thing you were supposed to do, to do that was part of life. Driving a car was part of life. Eating food was a part of life. To me, it seemed like killing was a part of life until I did it. Which makes me think that, this makes me think that goes back to the theory of like, it's something fundamental in who he is. He's always thought about it. Yeah. It seemed like part of life until he did it and realized, well, crap. Now there's a body that I have to deal with. And most people probably don't deal with this. So maybe I'm the one that's wrong. And then he starts calling to confess. Yeah, Paul. Most of us don't have to figure out what to do with a dead body. So I, I don't know. So then the third and final theory. Not really theory, but just thought. Yeah. 
is that all comes back to the mommy issues with these guys. I was going to say that stands out to me. Yes. That he wanted the picture of his mom's gravestone. Mm -hmm. And um, another weird thing is that all of his victims were wearing red when they died. That's weird. Yeah. And that's not really noted until really late because there's no reason that like that's ever given. Yeah. So what I think is that his mother was teaching him that like women who have sex outside of marriage are not good. Yeah. And maybe he was told that red was like. Oh, yeah. In that era. Sexual like wearing color. red. Yeah. In that era, red was a sexy color exactly and so that goes hand in hand with me when he's talking to denise and he's like you're just like the rest of those broads and he's <laughs> so attached to kimberly until he she lets or well, not lets i'm assuming not lets because she's 18 and he's 35 yeah or however old he was i'm assuming we will never know but i'm assuming it wasn't consensual yeah but until that happens he wants to be friends with kimberly yeah and he brings up kimberly so much so i think that it had something to do with the fact that he had sex with these women or that he raped these women or that they, in some way, to him, were not worthy of life. Yeah. So that voice inside his head told him to kill. I think that that is a safe bet. Yeah. And I think that the reason that Kathleen Greening was different um, was because he knew her personally. I don't. Yeah. That's the only thing that I kind of have a question about is I'm not sure if he meant like, he did, because he told them later on, like, they asked, like, how did she die? Like, what did you do? Did you hold her head under? He's like, no, no, I hold, I held both her shoulders down. So it's like, how did this happen, dude? What was the context? She's she's different. You didn't call. You didn't feel guilty after her? Or, like, did you just know that you were connected? It's just really bizarre to me. Yeah. It definitely makes sense that he wouldn't be as violent yeah. with her. Yeah. Because he knows her. Oh, maybe she found something out. I don't know. I mean, like, what are your thoughts? Oh, he's definitely got mommy issues. But I think that of every serial killer that only yeah. kills women. I think so, too. Exactly. And he definitely like saying the thing about the broads. And mm -hmm. the, I, I think that you're right. That sounds like because he's confessing. So I know in the beginning you said you weren't sure if they were Catholic or they were something else. Fundamental. Yeah, I, d I don't know. But if they were Catholic, which is very possible mm -hmm. in the 80s, yeah, up north, there yeah. was a lot more, to my knowledge, not that I'm a religious expert, but <laughs> <laughs> to my knowledge, uh, you know, the South was filled with Baptists mostly, mm -hmm. and the North was filled with Catholics and Protestants yeah. or of that nature. I mean, they're there's too many denominations to like yeah. really get into but nevertheless i could see that being the case yeah that was and the first like psychological theory about him that made sense to me yeah um and i don't think that it could be one way or the other i think it could be both yeah i don't think he was some evil genius who thought huh well if i call and act super guilty they'll think that i was confessed like i just think that it he was probably a very confused individual yeah like, he knew what he was doing was wrong, but he'd always felt like he wanted to do it. And he'd been told from day one that when you do something or something hurts you, you confess. Yeah. I think that's plausible because, like you said, you didn't think that because of his actions directly after they lose him when they're tailing him. Mm -hmm. And if he knew he was being tailed, why would he immediately... Go, go and, and do that. Like you would leave the city, you would leave like Yeah. Or you just stay low for a while. Yeah, exactly. But he immediately picks up somebody else. Kind of kind of makes you think he wasn't like my take on it isn't that he was like this genius, this no. evil genius that was just taunting the cops. No, I definitely don't think so. And some people do think that he was doing it to taunt them, but I really don't. It doesn't seem like it no and I, I don't honestly i'm not one of the people who's of the opinion that he's faking all these phone calls i mean like i said the first couple it sounded like fake like fake weepy like yeah. not that i mean i'm sure he had his reason for calling to confess or whatever yeah. but it didn't sound i question like it that's why it was funny because yeah. you're like this voice it's not real but then that third one 
is, sounds more yeah. genuine. The emotion sounds more genuine. For sure. So I think your theories are all plausible. Yeah. Unfortunately, the world will never know as he is dead. He's dead. He died of skin cancer very shortly after. So in prison. That's How old was he? Oh, gosh. Like in his late 50s. Okay. So he was 40 when he killed, or 38 when he killed Barbara Simon. Okay. And then he served 12 years before he was diagnosed. Gotcha. So, like in his late 50s, early 60s. It's actually pretty young mm -hmm. to have major skin cancer. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do with Paul Michael Stefani? Bury him, probably. Bury him. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe bury him next to his mother. He might like That's that. A, yes, he probably would. Ugh. Ma. Ma. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't, we apologize. We don't want to insult you if you call your mom ma. ma. But um, it's somewhat well, telling. <laughs> the, joke, the joke is from the Mindy Project. If you've ever seen that, Danny calls his mom ma. Ma. So it's me. Bit of a red it's flag. <laughs> it's a red flag. So. All right. Well, thank you for listening with me. Thanks for telling the story. You're welcome. Till next time. Till next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening, guys. Find us on Instagram and TikTok at Burden of Proof Pod and email us at burdenofproofpod at gmail.com.